Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, before I begin, I really want to say it's a privilege and an honor to come and present to you, and I really mean that. Um, I come from Capitol Square. I drove down from Richmond today, and people at Capitol Square, some of them at least, have very big egos. They think that it's all about them. But I know, and everyone in this room knows, that when it comes to governance, it's really, it's localities, it's you folks that really make a difference in your constituents' lives. So thank you all for the public service that you give to your citizens throughout the Commonwealth. Um, I'm the Executive Director for the uh, Ethics Council, Goya Council, and I'm using my handout throughout. Um, I hope everyone has a pen so you can jot down a couple things, because one of the nice things when I do things as a live presentation, I can give little tips, little hints, things that you can take with you that you will not necessarily get if you go to our online training. Uh, the council is a fairly new creation. We were created in basically 2015, and we were established in the legislative branch of government. And the reason why that is important to note is that the council does not have any investigatory authority. We do not have any enforcement authority. We do not have any uh, police authority. That's not why we were created. Instead, we were designed to be a essentially a small boutique law firm that is designed to give confidential advice to everyone throughout the state, state and local government. You are always completely safe coming to the council for advice or questions. Um, that is because uh, we take our confidentiality extremely seriously. The code specifically says that all questions and informal advice that come to us and from us are confidential. It further says that it is exempt from any FOIA requests, so people cannot even ask did someone approach you for advice. And further, we are so strict that we will neither confirm nor deny without your express permission that you came to us for counsel. Uh, that sometimes happens in situations where you will have a board with three people, and they all kind of have a, uh, a, the same question. One person is the one that asks for guidance. We give them the guidance, and then the other board members sometimes shortly later will say, hey, we heard from Chuck that you told Chuck that, and we won't confirm or deny. You want to go ahead and ask us the question again, we're glad to answer you, but we really do take confidentiality very seriously. So you can always come to us, and we'll never get in trouble for doing that. Um, our council duties are, you'll see, they're listed out on page two and page three. Uh, tip, most of what you see in this handout is just verbatim from the Code of Virginia, but it would be very boring to just read that on your own, let alone have to read it, so I just will go through and highlight some of the important things that I think you should know what we use before you. Council duties are set out in the Code, uh, under 30-356, and probably the most important one for everyone in this room is exactly number one, furnishing formal and informal guidance to all persons who are required to comply with the Conflict of Interest Act. Uh, formal uh, advisory opinions are somewhat analogous to attorney general opinions. Uh, they are published on the Council's website, but your anonymity is maintained. We will redact your name, uh, and we will also redact any identifying information, if possible or necessary, uh, to make sure that someone can't read the back pattern and go, oh, I know this clearly happened in, you know, Marengo County, this clearly happened in the city of Richmond. Um, the Council's policy is that uh, a request for formal advisory opinion must be submitted at least six weeks prior to a regularly scheduled Council meeting. Uh, these days, uh, the Council is only meeting about once or twice a year. So if you have something that you need a very rapid response time on, a formal advisory opinion is probably not the way to proceed. Um, also, specifically by statute, we cannot reveal or release the results of our analysis of the formal advisory opinion until the Council has formally looked at it, deliberated on it, and voted to approve it. So it's not something that you would probably need, and that's why we have very few requests for them. It's just not very time sensitive. And a lot of times when you have ethics questions, you need a little bit more rapid response. Um, people ask, what is the formal advisory opinion useful for? It's useful for situations where you have a question that you think is going to be of really broad applicability throughout the state. It happened to you, you had a question, and you think, well, other people out of the Commonwealth might want to know this as well. So it will be anonymous, but it's a broad question, and then it will be approved and then published on the Council's website. Probably what's more important for everyone is our informal guidance. And that is probably, at this point, close to 100% of all the informal guidance that we give. Uh, you can come to the council for guidance of any medium you want, uh, phone call, email, snail mail, fax, um, stop by our office. Um, our general rule of thumb is that we will initially respond to you with whatever medium you approach us with unless you ask otherwise. 
If you send me an email, I will email you back unless your email specifically says, don't email me, call me on my cell phone. Um, council's internal policy is that we will get you a response within two to four weeks. I would say it is very, very rare that we even get to the two week mark. And that usually is only when it's a very busy time for us with a lot of questions in our queue or during session, or it's a very complicated question where I'm having to actually review some contracts uh, and, and legal documents. I would say our normal response time is about three to five business days. If it's a simple question, it can be answered even more quickly. We are always aware that uh, time can sometimes be of the essence, so we will always make every effort to get an answer to you. If you are looking at a real deadline, please let us know, um, and I can, if possible, move you ahead of the queue if it's an emergency. Um, however, also, if you know an issue is going to be coming up, please do not wait till the day before your board meeting. Um, that has happened a few times. I have been able to get what we call a, a rush job and get a response. I am afraid there will be some time in the future where someone will wait till the morning of a board meeting, and I just will not have time to do the research of this complicated question. So the earlier you contact us and let us know what your deadline is, the better it is for everybody, but we will always try to get you an answer within two to five business days. I've said it before, I'm going to say it again, it is completely confidential. You could never ever get in trouble from coming to us for advice or guidance. You know, we never snitch on you, we don't squeal on you, we're not going to call the press, we're not going to call the local prosecutor. Um, I'm an attorney, arguably any communications we have between us is an attorney-client privilege, um, so you can always come to us. Not only are we a safe harbor in that regard, we are also a safe harbor in terms of criminal prosecution. However, in order to uh, qualify for the safe harbor prosecution provision, which is written in the code, there are three things that have to apply. Number one, your request for guidance or an opinion has to be in writing. The phone call does not count. Number two, our reply to you must be in writing as well. Please note, emails does suffice. You can email us and email back. That will count. And then the third thing that you need is there has to be a good faith disclosure of all of the relevant facts. Uh, you're not allowed to gain the system and neglect to tell me that, oh yeah, and it's my wife's company that's getting the contract. And if you neglect an important detail, obviously, no one is fooled and you're not going to get the safe harbor provisions. But if those three the conditions are satisfied, um, you cannot be prosecuted in Virginia for relying upon the guidance that is provided by the council. So, turning to page three, the other thing you will see that the council provides uh, that may be relevant for you is take a look at number 12. Receive and review requests for approval of travel submitted by individuals required to file a statement of economic interests. Very wordy, that's a long way of saying that we review and approve travel waivers, and I'll talk about travel waivers at the very end of my presentation. I will give you a quick tip. If you think you are going to need a travel waiver, please contact the council before you go on your trip. It would be absolutely dreadful if you went on a trip that was paid for by a lobbyist or someone that has a contract uh, with your county or your board, and then you found out that it actually didn't qualify and you are in the hole for however much the trip costs. So please check with us before you go on your trip. Uh, the bottom of page three and the top of page four is code section that applies to everybody in government at all levels, uh, state and local, is prohibited conduct, 2.23103. Uh, typically in our trainings, I do not go and read all 10 things because that would be very boring. Uh, but this is important to know. I tell everybody either tonight, tomorrow, sometime this week, go ahead very quickly, just take two minutes, five minutes, read all 10 things of prohibited conduct. It is important to keep in the back of your mind. Even though it is extremely important in some ways, it's also the one area of FOIA that we probably get the fewest questions on because in some ways it is the most obvious. If I was to boil 2.23103 down into something very, very simple, I would say, if some suspicious guy wants to give you a gift or make you a business proposition and it feels bad, don't do it. <laughs> you know, stay away from squirrely people. Don't take bribes. Um, and that's precisely why we don't get a lot of questions on this issue. Um, if anyone is asking, you probably already realize that it's something you should not be doing. The only thing I will draw your attention to is on page three of the four, use of confidential information. I think everybody in this room would recognize it is intrinsically bad if you got confidential information that you acquired by reason of your position. Oh, the new highway overpass is going on. This is a parcel of land. Uh, and you went ahead and used that for your own personal benefit. Um, Virginia law is a little bit stricter than that. Not only can you not use confidential information for your own benefit, you also can't give it to anyone else for their benefit. You 
and are not allowed to like call up a college buddy and go, hey, I'm not allowed to act on this myself, but you know, buy acting stock. No, if it's confidential, it must remain confidential. You are not allowed to share it, use it, give it to anyone else for purposes until it becomes public knowledge. Now we get to something that's a little bit more tricky than uh, squirrely conduct, and that is the subject of conflicts of interest. It's funny, the Act, its proper name is the State and Local Government Conflict of Interest Act. And then, thanks to the wonderful drafting we do up at the General Assembly, the term conflict of interest is actually not used one time throughout the entire Act, <laughs> even though that's the name, of, the name of the Act. Instead, the actual terminology, and that's what we're using here on forward, is personal interest. If you have a personal interest in something, and then it's either going to be permissible or impermissible. Uh, personal interest applies to two situations, contracts and transactions. Uh, but before we can get there, we need a little bit of a background. Personal interest has a specific definition which we always need to pay attention to. It's provided in 2.23101. It's a financial benefit or liability that accrues to an officer and employee or to a member of his immediate family. Take out your pencils. Immediate family does have a definition as well. It is your spouse, whether or not they are living with you, it's always your spouse, and it is anybody that does live with you and whom you claim as a dependent on your taxes. Usually that is children around the ages of 16, 17, 18, they haven't quite left the nest yet and have jobs. Um, it could include, you know, perhaps a stranger, an in-law, or something like that, um, but they have to both reside <coughs> with you and you claim as a dependent on taxes. Um, your spouse is always immediate family. <laughs> Why do we need to pay attention to immediate family? And I do have a tendency sometimes to just revert to spouse, because that's the most common immediate family that you deal with in the real world. Um, it is because any personal interest that your spouse has gets imputed to you as well. So that's why you always need to keep that in mind. And, you'll hear a little bit, any gifts that go to your spouse from a donor that you need to keep track of, it gets imputed to you as well which kind of makes sense. Um, the lobbyist realizes that he's not allowed to give you a $10,000 gift. He cannot evade the, the concepts and laws of FOIA by just going ahead and giving you know, a you know, $10,000 necklace to your spouse. So immediate family, spouse, it always, the things get imputed to you in terms of personal interest and gifts. Um, the code then goes on to say that a personal interest exists by reason of, and it lists six things. It's really the first three that we see probably 90% of the time. Ownership in a business, if the ownership interest is exceeding 3% of the total, or take a look at two and three, annual income or salary, other compensation, fringe benefits, any other type of benefits, paid or provided by a business, uh, property, etc., that exceeds or can be anticipated to exceed $5,000 annually. So the two things that will trigger the personal interest is $5,000 or 3% equity of the company. Those are the three, always keep in mind, 3%, $5,000. Well, now we have a definition of personal interest. We know that if it applies to our spouse, it gets imputed to us. Um, what do we do with this? Well, take a look near the bottom of page four, personal interest in a contract. And what is a good example of this, practically speaking? I work for the Division of Legislative Services, that's the ethics council is under them, and let us suppose that my wife works for Apple Computer, and Reinforce the previous point. We're in the middle of a divorce, but we're not divorced yet. She's moved out to Seattle, Washington. She works for Apple. Meanwhile, the Division of Legislative Services has decided that we all need to get new laptops when we're running around to committee meetings. So they're going to purchase 60 Apple laptop computers. Well, does anyone see where an issue might start to be arising here? <laughs> I don't work for Apple, but my wife does. I assume she gets more than $5,000 a year. And Apple company is about to get a nice big fat contract of, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000, however much that the laptops are. So we have a situation where I have a personal interest in Apple through my wife, and I'm gonna have a personal interest in a contract because my agency is getting ready to have a contract. This is where I always tell people, stop, Review things, contact the council for advice. Another way I sometimes explain this is, if you ever find yourself in a situation where money from your board, your agency, um, your county, your locality, 
is about to go into your pocket, but not directly through your normal paycheck, but taking a circuitous route, stop and be very careful, because this is where you may have a problem. May, not guaranteed, but you may. You can see the actual language um, written on page four. You cannot have a personal interest in a contract with your agency other than your own contract of employment. That's the general rule. However, there are many exceptions to this general rule. In fact, there's so many exceptions that there's a specific statute that's called further exceptions to having personal interest in contracts. And if you think about it, that actually is necessary because my situation, completely unbeknownst to me, my wife took a job at Apple, and then unbeknownst to me, my boss is getting ready to buy a bunch of Apple computers. Oh dear, do I have to quit my job? No, I do not have to, but I have to review the situation to make sure I have not violated COIA, I haven't violated the act inadvertently. Now, one of the main uh, exceptions that applies is if someone's personal interest in a company is solely due to income. My wife does not own Apple, she owns less than 3% of Apple. Her interest is only buying salary, $5,000. And I, the government employee, did not play any part in negotiating the contract. And my wife did not play any part in negotiating the contract, that's a valid exception. Everything's okay, the law has not been broken, and if you think about it in terms of common sense, the public is reassured that there was no funny business because you know there wasn't any side dealing. I was completely hands off from the transaction and so was my spouse. So if there's any number of exceptions that can apply, but I really want everyone here to just think that's the situation. Money from my board or my agency is making a securities route to either my wife's pocket or my pocket or a company that we have an interest in. At that point, please check with the council. That's what we're here for. We will review things. We'll let you know if everything is okay or if you need to take any prophylactic steps to make sure you don't inadvertently cross COIA. But that is the general concept about having a personal interest in a contract and then making sure that you don't inadvertently violate that um, by checking and making sure that, oh, I should not have been participating in approving that contract on my board's part or my agency's part. It's personal interest in a contract. Personal interest in a transaction is very, very similar. If you turn page four to the top of page five, a uh, transaction is defined pretty broadly. It's any matter considered by any governmental advisory agency, whether in a committee, a subcommittee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on which official action is taken or contemplated. So it's very broad. The general rule of thumb is, if you have a personal interest in a transaction, you will not be permitted to participate unless you qualify for an exception, just like with contracts. But I want to caution everybody. Unlike with contracts, for transactions, the number of exceptions is much, much more limited. There's three, arguably five. Uh, and if you do not fit within uh, one of the exceptions for a personal interest in a transaction, you cannot participate and you sort of have to withdraw from that particular matter. Let me give you an example to sort of uh, make this clear. We found out that I don't have to quit my job just because my boss decided he wants to buy Apple computers. Well, let's suppose my boss comes to me and says, hey, Stuart, uh, we want you to go ahead and design the specs for what we are looking for because it turns out we actually are gonna have to put this up for some competitive blind bidding. Um, go ahead and write the specs for what we need for the initial proposals. Does anyone think that I can be or will appear that I'm gonna be transparent and impartial on this when I'm drafting the specs? No, I mean, just come on, folks. This, is, this, this just looks too awful. I, mean, I can easily steer initial requirements so that, yeah, number one, you know, the company must rhyme with Snapple. Um, I mean, it's silly. It's silly, but I mean, at that point, I can't be impartial. I can't be impartial, and I should not be involved in that transaction when it's involving money going to my wife's company. So that's an example where the number of exceptions for a transaction are much more limited and much more careful if you find you're going to have a transaction that's involving uh, property or an entity or a company or anything that you have a personal interest in. Um, once again, as always, come to the council for advice. We are glad to advise you as confidential and we will let you know whether you can participate or not. The last thing I will say about this is, this is the key thing. Regardless of whether this personal interest in a transaction is permissible or it's impermissible, regardless of whether you're gonna be able to go forward and join in debate and discussion and vote, or whether you can't, either way, you will have to make a public declaration of your personal interest. If you're allowed to proceed, you can say, I have a personal interest in this matter, Mr. Chairman, because actually the piece of property that you're talking about, uh, uh, 
changing the zoning for, um, I have a 50% interest in. However, I do qualify for the exception to participate under B3. On the other side, go, well, no exception applies, Mr. Chairman, I will not be participating in this transaction. Uh, once again, um, if you have any questions about this, always feel free to come to us. We're glad to help you out and let you know whether you can proceed with the transaction or not. Thank you for bearing with me for some of the uh, more uh, less interesting stuff about uh, personal interests. We now get to some of the more interesting stuff, which is gifts. Everyone likes to talk about gifts, uh, but I take it pretty much everyone in this room has to file a statement of economic interests, everyone's local elected. Uh, I'm in the same boat with you as well, I file every year. And so for gifts, the main thing I think everyone really wants to know is, can I accept it, do I have to report it? Um, but a better way to sort of think of that question is not two ways, but three ways. Is it a gift? Does it count towards my $100 gift cap? Do I have to report it on my statement of economic interest? So I'm going to address all three of those things uh, in order. Um, remember always in the background, the one thing you need to know is who is giving it to you, what is it, and what is its value? Those are the factual questions. Um, General Assembly members in particular, or I should say their legislative aides, are notorious for calling me up and saying, hey, Delegate so-and-so just got you know NASCAR tickets. Can he accept them? Can he go? And I always say, I don't know. Who is giving the delegate the tickets? And then the aide says, I don't know. And I go, well, I don't know either. <laughs> There's two of us that do not know. I cannot even begin to advise you as to whether it's proper to accept those tickets or not. We have to know who is it that's actually giving you the gift. What is it? I stress the what part because you're going to hear from this point forward, I'll repeat a couple times, uh, offers to have uh, entities pay for travel, for conferences and trips, and your official business have heightened reporting requirements, and then the value. So we need to know who is it, what is it, what's the value. Going back to the legal questions, in fact, is it a gift? Um, you can see on page five the definition of a gift, right out of 2.23101, and it's it's everything. It's any gratuity, favor, discount, entertainment, hospitality, loan, forbearance, everything under the sun. Um, everything essentially has a value. Um, the only things that we have behind with guidance are basically hugs and junk mail, but everything else will always have value. Uh, I stress this because a lot of times the people that want to give you gifts will also reassure you incorrectly that you can accept it or you don't have to report it. And are you gonna trust the person that's trying to give it or will you come and trust us who are neutral and will steer you right? Just a word of warning. Sometimes we have heard lobbyists say, oh, it was free, I got these for free, so I'm just passing it on to you so it's free, it's not a gift. That is absolutely an erroneous conclusion. The lobbies may have received it for free, but somewhere, somewhere along the line, someone paid for those NASCAR tickets. So always assume that something has value and it is a gift. Now, the General Assembly has realized that there's sometimes you just have to sort of accept things. It's, it's part of being in the jobs and positions we're in. So they have made a list of 16 exceptions to what is a gift for purposes of FOIA, for purposes of the Act. I have listed them all on page five, going on to page six. Um, I heard a little laughter. Yes, it's correct. The General Assembly themselves, they like to get their swag. Um, so it's amazing how every two to three years another item gets added onto the list. Um, but we have 15 things that do not count as a gift. I'm gonna highlight just a few of the main ones that you were likely to encounter. Uh, number five, any gift that's related to your private profession or occupation or volunteer service or that of your immediate family or your spouse. If a gift is coming to you truly because of your private job, uh, and it's not a violation of 2.23103 as I talked about earlier, um, you can always accept it. It's not viewed as a gift. You can accept it. You do not have to report it. Um, six and seven kind of combine uh, food or beverages that are consumed while you're attending an event at which you are performing official duties. And then number seven, food, beverages, and the registration or attendance fees that get waived if you go and are a featured speaker, presenter, or lecturer. For number seven, it's not just you were invited to attend, you actually are a speaker, presenter, or lecturer. When you're there, obviously, it would be kind of rude of the hosts to say, hey, you're coming and presenting for an hour. Oh, and you're also going to have to pay $100 to enter the, the exhibit hall. So you can accept the free entry. You can go to the other courses that are offered at the conference. You can always eat the food. Uh, beverages that are offered throughout the course of the conference and the meeting. It's not a gift. You may have to report this. Um, please note for number seven, take out your pencils. It's talking about food, beverages, and attendance fees. It's not talking about travel. It's not talking about lodging. That's not covered in the exception, and that is precisely why at the end of my presentation you'll hear me talk about travel waivers. You may need to get a travel waiver if whoever is inviting you as a speaker is also going to pay for lodging and travel. 
Uh, number 11 is related to travel on page 6. Travel paid for provided by the government of the United States and territories in the state and the public in the state. What this basically boils down to, folks, is um, you, if it's for official business, can always accept a gift of travel paid for by pretty much anyone. However, you may have to report it. In fact, you almost will certainly have to report it unless it is being paid for by the Commonwealth, by a locality, by a state or local agency. But let's say uh, the state of Delaware wants you to come up and speak about you know, water conservation things that work very well in your district. And you say, well, I'd love to go speak to you, but I don't have enough money in my county budget to travel to Delaware. So oh, no trouble, we'll, we'll pay for you. We'll put you on a hill, get you a plane flight up there, put you up for the night. Um, you'll be able to accept that, absolutely. That's not a gift, you can accept it. You're probably gonna have to report that, but you will have to. So travel in general can be accepted, but you will be reporting it, right? reporting requirements for travel. Number 14 is one they call a real lifesaver. But this is always the question I go to first. Gifts with a value of less than $20. Uh, the General Assembly has decided that gifts that are under $20, so 1999 and under, are so de minimis you do not have to keep track of them. You can always accept them, don't have to aggregate them, don't have to keep a, a running ledger of them like other types of gifts, they're so de minimis. It really helps you out because you go to a conference and they're handing out you know, cool little uh, rubber rocks and you know, their, uh, 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 coffee mugs, things like that. Under $20, you can accept it, don't have to worry about it. Uh, number 15, uh, attendance at receptions or similar functions where foods such as hors d'oeuvres and beverages that can be conveniently consumed by a person while standing or walking are offered. Yes, we call this the cocktail party rule or sometimes called the toothpick rule. Um, if someone invites you to one of those sort of stand-up receptions where you have you know, the meatballs on the toothpick and little slices of cheese, you can go to those, you can accept, you can have a fun time, eat as many meatballs as you like, and you do not have to report it, it is not a gift. The only thing I'll caution on, I don't think it's happened too much at the local level, but we have seen some pressure at the state level where certain large lobbying entities have tried to claim that, oh, this you know steak and mashed potatoes and lobster tail was really a stand-up event because we had one stand-up table, and that just doesn't work. That's really violating the spirit of Koya, and that does not suffice because no one eats a steak standing up. But legitimate cocktail party things, you know, hospitality suites, things like that, you can always go to, you can always accept, you don't have to report them. Uh, and then lastly, number 16, we have sort of two things mixed in here for number 16, gifts from relatives. You can always accept a gift from a relative. The list is uh, specific, but it's pretty broad, spouse, child, uncle, aunt, niece, nephew, cousins, fiance, uh, etc. If there's any kind of family relation that is not included in the list, let us know, and we will see if we can add this to the list, but it's pretty comprehensive now. Um, you can always accept a gift from a relative, always, always, and you do not have to report it. The other one we have is a personal friend. Um, but notice the very last sentence of number 16. For purposes of this definition, a personal friend does not include a person that you know or has reason to know is a registered lobbyist or a registered lobbyist principal. A registered lobbyist principal or, take out your pencils, Important one for everyone in this room, contractor. Somebody that has a contract with your board or your locality, or someone that is trying to get a contract with your board or your locality. Well, how about a practical example? What does this really mean? I have a very good friend who is a lobbyist. I've known him since grade school. He was the best man at my wedding. Um, and he knows my 30th wedding anniversary is coming up. He wants to give me a really nice present. He's gonna buy me and my wife a, a cruise to the Bahamas. Um, but it says, for purposes of this definition, personal friend can include him. Does that mean that I cannot accept this gift from my good personal friend? Actually, I will be able to, folks. I will be able to, provided I declare it. I'll talk a little bit about the declaring uh, reporting requirements in a little bit, but you're going to find that that is how this plays out in practice. You can accept things from your personal friends, even if they have a contract with your board or they're trying to get a contract. You can accept the gifts, but Sunshine Law, transparency, you're going to have to report that I received this present you know, from my friend in the nature of personal friendship. So we have a broad definition of gifts, certain things get excluded, and then you'll see Basically, items that are exempted from the definition of a gift are not subject to something called the $100 gift cap, which I will talk about next. And you don't have to report them as a gift on your statement of economic interests. But look at the immediate line below that. 
Travel that's not a gift can still be reportable on Schedule F, your travel section, and that's because travel always has the height reporting requirements. $100 gift cap, I just mentioned that. What is it? Probably uh, exactly what you think it is. There is a general rule that anyone who is required to file a statement of economic interest is limited. They have a cap of $100 in a year, a calendar year, that's for $100 for you and $100 for your spouse, your immediate family, from any one donor. If the donor is a lobbyist, a lobbyist principal, or what we call a contractor, has a contractor trying to get a contract. So immediately when someone asks me, uh, I've got a gift, can I accept it, do I have to report it? My third first question is always, is it under $20? And the second one is, who's giving it to you? It's not a lobbyist, it's not a lobbyist principal, it's not a contractor. You can accept it, don't have to worry about it. If the gift is coming from someone that actually is, falls into one of those three categories, the lobbyist, the lobbyist principal, the contractor, and it's $20 or more, you do have to keep a written ledger throughout the calendar year about what you are receiving from them because that may be reportable. So we have a $100 cap. And I mentioned earlier that $100 account, of course, and it also applies to your spouse, but it's $100 for each of you. What happens if you get a gift that is over $100? You will have to politely turn it down, or you can pay down the difference. So if someone gives you a $150 bottle of wine, but it's a really good wine and you really would like to have it, and you don't want to hurt their feelings, you are permitted to give them $50, and you can pay it down to $100. At that point, you cannot accept anything else from them over the course of the year because you're exactly at your cap. A uh, practical tip, if you were going to pay down the difference to get to the $100, uh, do it in the form of a, of a check so you have a written record. It's going to make the life a lot easier if questions ever come up about that. So always keep a record of that. Are there any exceptions to this $100 cap? There's three broad exceptions that are most applicable. Uh, number one is, sort of related to how this plays out, the personal friend exception. Uh, my best friend, Best man at my wedding, wants to give me $800 set of golf clubs, he wants to send me and my wife on a cruise to Hawaii. I can accept that, provided that gift is being given to me in terms of the nature of personal friendship, and it's not a lobbying expense or something like that. Um, it's interesting the code does not define personal friend, which is probably good, because I mean, how do you define personal friends? Uh, I think we've all had instances where we've met people, and an hour later we knew we were going to be best friends for life. Uh, and other times, you're like, oh, I've, I've known them for 30 years, and slowly I kind of recognize them now as they're a really good friend. They've always been there for me. We don't define a personal friend, but we do define the nature of giving a, a gift in the nature of personal friendship. It's set out on the very top of page 7, you know, 1 A, B, C, D. It makes sense. The circumstances under which the gift is offered, the history. Um, the real key one is numbers, uh, or letters C and D. To the extent known whether the donor, that's your friend, personally paid for it, or they're going in and they're just expensing it, or getting a business reimbursement for it, um, or they're getting a tax deduction for it. Um, I think we can all sort of realize in sort of common sense that you know, if he gives me an $800 set of golf clubs and then he's turning around and billing Dominion Power for that, that's really not like a personal gift to me. It was part of his lobbying job. He was you know, passing me on. So it has to be personally paid for by him. And then, um, Number D, whether the donor is given the same or similar gifts to other persons required to file the disclosure. You know, some of these gift baskets are absolutely amazing. They've got you know, bottles of wine and fruits and kiwis and all kinds of nice stuff. It's like $150. Like, oh, thank you. I mean, that's very, very nice of you. And you find out, oh, every other board member also got the same gift basket. That's not being given to you the nature of personal friendship. It's because you know his boss or whoever he lobbies for says, hey, give everyone fruit baskets. So that's not personal friendship. But if we're talking about gifts that are given in the nature of true personal friendship, you can accept it regardless of the value, but you'll report it. Exception number two is called the widely attended event exception. I'm sure every one of you has heard this phrase. I want to caution everybody to be very, very careful. There is a horrible tendency for a lot of people, lobbyists and contractors, to try to give tickets to expensive events and reassure you, oh, don't worry, it's a widely attended event. And one of my real fears looking forward down the road is someone is going to accept some really expensive tickets, like, I don't know, $1,000 tickets for something. And then they're going to find out after the fact it does not qualify for a widely attended event, and they are well over the $100 limit by exactly, you know, $900, or, you know, if it's a $10,000 ticket, $9,900. And then by law, you're going to have to stoke a big check that you almost maybe not be able to be afford to the person who gave it to you because they erroneously told you it was a widely attended event, and it was not. 
So, I want to preface what I'm about to say with if you have any questions about the event that you're going to, if it's a widely attended event, check with us first. We will review it and let you know whether in fact it is a widely attended event or not. For something to be a widely attended event, two conditions have to apply. One, at least 25 people have to be invited or are reasonably anticipated to attend. That makes sense. I would love to hear someone try to argue that you invited five board members to a $1,000 dinner at Morton's and that was widely attended. No, that was five people. It's 25 people don't have to all show up, but at least anticipated to attend and invite. So 25. Here's the part where it gets a little more complicated. The event must be open to individuals who are all members of a public, civic, charitable, or professional organization. They're from a particular industry or profession, or they all represent persons interested in a particular issue. So an example I'd like to use is every year, uh, the Red Cross does an incredible black tie fundraising ball up in Washington, D.C. It's really nice. I think it's like $500 a ticket. You are given a ticket to attend. That probably counts as a widely attended event. Um, there's going to be more than 25 people there, and it's all open to people that are from one particular uh, charitable or professional organization. Someone just gives you tickets to the Super Bowl. You are not allowed to claim, and the General Assembly made this very clear two years ago, you can't say, oh, everyone at the stadium has a common interest, we all like football. That will not suffice. So if you have any questions about this, whether it's satisfying that second prong, please contact the council. It's better to find out ahead of time than to be stuck afterwards having to stow the check. Already this has happened three times, and I'm aware of in Virginia. Fortunately, the amounts were small. Um, people had to stow the check for $200 and $100, respectively. I just want to let everyone know and let your compatriots know we don't want it to be a situation where someone's going to have to write a thousand dollar check so come to us first and we'll let you know whether it does satisfy the second prong of a widely attended event and then the third exception for a hundred dollar cap is travel is approved via a travel waiver um, a good way to think about this is in this day and age even if you are given travel on a Greyhound bus and you're staying in a Motel 6 you're probably going to exceed a hundred dollars uh, your trip is being paid for by a lobbyist, a lobbyist principal, or a contractor. Um, oh, and it's totally legitimate. You know, the ABA wants you to go and present in Chicago. The plane fare there and hotel is well over 100. If you go, you'll be able to go, but because it's being paid for by, in that case, a lobbyist, you need to get a travel waiver from the council first. If you get the travel waiver, you don't have to worry about the $100 gift card. Once again, if you have questions about whether you think you need a travel waiver or not, please contact the council. We'll review the situation and let you know whether you need to get the waiver or not. So, I've already mentioned you've got a $100 gift cap when it comes from three groups, lobbyists, lobbyist principals, contractors. You can pay the difference down. Um, but always remember this, people get caught up on this. Any exception to the gift cap is not going to be an exception from your requirement to report the gifts on your statement of economic interest. In fact, it's just the opposite. If you're ever looking at my handout, or you're looking at the code, and you're doing an analysis, and you go, oh, $100 gift cap applies. That is precisely the kind of gift that must be reported on your statement of economic interests. So we've talked about $100 gift cap, we talked about the nature of gifts, reporting gifts. The general rule is, you have to report any gift valued over $50, or any combination of gifts aggregated over $50 that you receive from any one lobbyist, lobbyist principal, or contractor over the course of a calendar year. Is fifty dollars that triggers the reporting amount. If you get a twenty-five dollar lunch and then you get a twenty dollar lunch, you don't have to report either lunch because you were under fifty dollars. You get two twenty-five dollar lunches and a thirty dollar gift basket. Now you're reporting everything. You're reporting the lunches and the gift basket because combined they are all over fifty dollars. So that's why when you receive gifts that are more than twenty dollars from a lobbyist, a lobbyist principal, or a contractor. You need to keep kind of a ledger going throughout the course of the year to see if you hit that $50 mark. And alternatively, have you hit the $100 mark. So, people sometimes ask, what happens if I get a gift and I really don't want to accept it? Um, I, don't, I don't like reporting requirements or, you know, it's too, too tricky for me. Um, there's nothing in the law that says you have to accept everything that's given to you. You're obviously, well, I mean, that's the whole definition of a gift. It's voluntarily given. You can say, no, thank you. Um, you can return it to the person if it was sent to you by you know, mail or it was dropped off at your office. I have done that with a book myself that I didn't really want and it was over $20. Um, you are also allowed to pay the full market value of the item and that before is no longer viewed as a gift. Uh, hopefully this will not happen to anyone in the room. Occasionally we have had lobbyists try to play games where they say, oh, this $80 coffee table was really only $22. 
double check it. If you have any questions, come to us because if we review this and we put it in writing, uh, then you are guaranteed to be you know, immune from any questions because we look at that as well. Um, it doesn't happen too often, but so when you're gonna pay the value, it has to be the true fair market value of the gift. But if you pay it off, you have to receive the gift. And then the last thing you are allowed to do is you can donate your gift to a charity. The charity does have to be a legitimate 401c3 or equivalent charity. Uh, your secretary does not count as a charity, even though it would be very nice to give her the gift basket. <laughs> the garbage can does not count as a charity, that also does not count. It has to be a true legitimate charity, but you can donate your gift that you don't want to the charity. Um, you are not allowed then to take a tax deduction for giving that gift because then you'd still be getting some kind of a value from the gift that you're supposedly not accepting. So no tax deduction, you have to donate it. And a practical tip, keep very good records on this one as well. Um, you want to have very good written documentation in case questions ever came up that you in fact uh, did donate the gift that you did not want uh, to a charity. Reporting of gifts, what do you report your gifts on? You report them on your statement of economic interest. We come near the end on page seven. Um, they're always filed, you know, uh, at the first day of office, and then regularly every month in the month of January annually. That's where you report your gifts on the statement of economic interest. Who are you filing your statement of economic interest with? I think everybody knows, but you will be filing it with your local clerk. So here is local official, correct? State officials file with the council. Local officials will file with your local clerk. Any constitutional office in here? Constitutional officers do file online and do file with them. So, um, you see on the top of page 8, uh, when you file annually every February 1, uh, if the deadline falls on a weekend or a state holiday, it automatically gets moved to the next business day. I believe in 2020, February 1, the week is a Saturday, so everyone gets two extra days, it will be moved to Monday. Um, <coughs> Practical word of advice, because I see it happen all too often, don't wait till the last day. Do not wait till the last day, because if something goes wrong and you miss the deadline, the deadline is strict and then you will be late. And if you are late, you can see next item down on page 8, there is a $250 penalty for filing late. Um, the $250 is aggravating, I am sure, um, but that is not the real teeth of this, and I think everyone in this room uh, knows what I'm talking about. No, the real teeth of this is this is a public record. Everybody will now know that you could not meet the filing deadline if you filed it late, even though you had a whole month to do it in. So, uh, if for some reason you are not going to be able to file on time, um, you are allowed to request a deadline extension from the council. Um, the council has five business days to reply to your request, and if we need additional information, we get five business days in response to, to that as well. But please be advised that under the code, the reasons for a deadline extension are limited and they're limited to very severe things. I mean, we listed them on page eight. The death of a relative. The governor has declared a state of emergency and the emergency interfered with your ability to time to file. The file is a member of the Uniformed Services of the United States. This is on active duty. Uh, number four, failure of electronic filing system will not apply to you because you are locals or good cause shown. Um, the council has taken a position uh, that good cause will be limited to severely extreme things like the examples provided in the code. So hospitalization, yes. Spouse in the hospital, yes. Diagnosed with cancer, yes. I'm going on vacation, no. I forgot, no. I was too busy, no. And the all-time worst one, you sent the reminder to me, not to my secretary. You should have sent it to her because she does it. No. <laughs> Come on, folks. We're all adults. We've got a month to get it done. We can ask for extension if we need it. Let's, let's not be late. Let's not be late. Let's get it done by February 1. Uh, now we turn to travel waivers. Talked about travel waivers and the reason that we have them is there's a legitimate official business trip that I am going on for my position. Um, I need to go to a conference to educate myself. I'm going to an important conference because it's my turn around the country to, to be presenting, something like that. Um, my trip is being paid for by a lobbyist, a lobbyist principal, a contractor. It's being paid for by the ABA. Um, it's being paid for by Vega. It's being paid for by you know, some entity like that. It's perfectly acceptable to go. I mean, we want our public officials to you know participate in conferences, learn, trade notes, um, helps us do a better job at home. 
but you're over the $100 limit from one of those three groups, either the contractor, lobbyist principal, or lobbyist, you get a travel waiver from the council. Travel waivers are found exactly on the council's website. There's a little link, you click on it, it comes down, you fill it out, send it in. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'll say it again, if you're not sure if you need a travel waiver or not, please let us know. Um, it saves a lot of time. We actually get probably a third of all travel waiver requests are requests for travel that are being paid for by your own agency. So then we always call up the person and say, well, you, you said DMV is paying for your, your travel. Why, why did you put in a travel waiver? I don't know. It's like, well, you really didn't need to do that, and now we wasted everyone's time when you didn't need a travel waiver that's being paid for by your own state agency. So if you have a question, let us know, and then, we'll, and then, and then go ahead if you need to and fill out the travel waiver. Um, travel waivers can be required for travel. It's, if it's over $100, it's being paid for. It gets you over that cap. And you'll see, I've listed page two, it's not required for government paid travel or travel paid by any other entity that is not the lobbyist, lobbyist principal contract. So, uh, fairly simple. And like I said, if you have any questions about it, as with everything else, come to the council for advice. You'll see on the top of page nine, our travel waiver request process. Um, we have five business days to respond to your request. Um, this is the only part in the code where if you do not hear from us, it is automatically assumed by law to have been granted. Um, that has never happened. We have never failed to respond within five business days. Um, but anyways, that is the law. If you don't respond, it's automatically deemed to be approved. Um, coming near the uh, end of the presentation on page nine, we wrap up a couple questions. These are simple questions, but we put them in our training because we tended to get a lot of them, especially in the early days of council. Uh, people sometimes ask us, Okay, under what circumstances is individual information released or filings released? Um, these are public documents, folks. I mean, that's the whole purpose of these things, is reassuring the public, uh, transparency and sunshine, that these are the uh, companies I have personal interest in, this is property that I may have uh, in the county, generally speaking. I mean, that's the whole point. These are supposed to be public uh, documents. They're not supposed to be given. So they will always be uh, available or accessible. Your clerk uh, is supposed to treat them as a public document, and everybody has the right to come on in and take a look at them. Um, it is for fact this uh, very reason that um, you'll see a little bit further down, but I'll state it now. Um, the <coughs> documents will have redacted from them. Your clerk is required to redact any residential address, any personal telephone number, or your actual signature. So those three things will be redacted. There's only one place on the entire form where you would put potentially a real street address, and that's on the very first page right next to your name that asks you for your business address. If you choose, as some people do, to say, I live at 151 Shady Lane, and I'm going to put 151 Shady Lane as my business address, you have said to the world, that's my business address, it's my home address, and that does not get redacted. I mean, you, evidently, you have said, I, I don't mind if the world knows where I live. Um, some people don't mind that. Most people do, so you are allowed for that address, that business address. You can put the address of your board, you can put the address of you know, your city hall, your town hall, uh, something equivalent to that. You do not have to. But that is the one residential address piece of information that will not be redacted because if you write it there, the clerk and everyone else will assume you have no problems letting the world know that your business was in your home and this is where your home is. Your signature will be redacted, phone numbers will be redacted, and there's nowhere else on the form that asks for a street address. It will only ask you for counties uh, for in terms of property. Like I own a piece of property in Roanoke and another piece of property in the city of Norfolk. It doesn't ask for street addresses. Minor children. Uh, you are permitted if you elect and you have minor children and you want to keep that private, their names, you do not have to list their names under the immediate family. You are permitted to say minor child A, minor child B, minor child C. Um, that is your choice. Um, if you choose, and some people do, once again, not many, but some do, that, oh, I have no problem letting know that my children whom I love are named Tom and Sally and Jenny. Um, if you put that there, the clerk will not redact it because it's assumed that you have no problem letting the world know that your children's names are Tom and Sally and Jenny. Um, if you don't want that, it's up to you to say minor child A, minor child B. Are <coughs> uh, filers notified, question number two, when their disclosure forms are requested and released? Uh, under the law and under FOIA, there is no request, but there's no requirement for that. I know some local courts will do that as a, as a courtesy to you, but be advised they do not have to, that's not any requirement by the FOIA law or FOIA law. Um, what training is required? Uh, as of July 1, as you all know, um, all local elected officials, it only applies to elected officials, but that includes constitutional officers and school board members, 
are required to take a similar training, the FOIA training, that is required by state officials and officers that also have to file a statement of economic interests. Um, if you were in office on July 1, you have until December 31 to complete the training. Uh, if you came into office on July 2, because of the way the code was drafted, and I played no part in drafting it, uh, you don't have till December 31, you actually had two months to get the training done. Um, thereafter, it's going to revert to the same training schedule that is for state officers and officials that file a statement of economic interests or a financial disclosure statement at the state level for certain boards. And that is you have to have your training within two months of assuming your office, where you raise your hand or you attend your first board meeting. So you've got two months to get the training done. Remember, your filing is done on your first day on the job or beforehand, two, up to two months after. After you had your initial training, then you have to have a, a refresher training once every two years. So, uh, the good news, folks, uh, thank you for bearing with me on this, is you are now all good for two years. So, thank you very much. So, I, I think we, we had kind of promised that we had the answer by 4 o'clock, but we have time for some questions. Are, are there questions that we have? Yes, sir. No, really elected like officials, just just go back. Did they take the training prior to being sworn in in January? Uh, yes, sir, you did. What yes, ma'am. What did the state gift? I've done, I, I did travel to another country, and they, they sent me a, a, a gift that I, I, I had no interest in, and I did actually put in, it was a kid bleaching kit, and I actually did trash it. So, because, no, thank you. Um, what, what should I have done? Should I have turned it around and given it back to them? Send it back? Yes, actually, it's funny. You came across one of the rare things I don't know how to cover in a training because it is so unique. Um, there, well, there's three things. You could turn around and return it to them. You can pay for the cost of it. You could have, I guess, donated it to a charity. Maybe some charitable organization would have wanted it. Um, another thing, actually, is for gifts only that are given to you by a foreign dignitary. I'm doing this off of memory. I'm not going to flip them arms around the code. Uh, you are allowed to, if it comes from a foreign government, you are allowed to accept it essentially in the name of the Commonwealth. And then you have to turn around and donate it to the Library of Virginia. So that's another one. <laughs> <laughs> so it could be an artifact in this country that has a skin which you get. Stuart, I, the one thing, as a reminder on that, whatever you do, you should document. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Yeah, don't, don't keep it just in your memory as well. Yes, sir, there's some other questions. I want to make sure I get your point. If you really would like to do some of that and do this within the next two months, did I need to do that? Uh, if you, uh, his question is when, if you were an elected official, when is your time deadline to get the training done? Um, if you were just elected um, and haven't taken your office yet, you have two months from after when you take office. Yeah, there was sort of a six month grace period between July 1 and December 31 where they gave a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. I'm not certain on that one, and that's one of those questions where let me go ahead and double check on that and uh, let me know. I'm contacting me afterwards. I, I, I hate to say things for the moment, so I, I get them wrong, so I like to check on this. Contractor, a lobbyist, or a lobbyist principal, then you can always accept it. Don't have to worry about it. If you received like a ninety-dollar bouquet from a contractor, that possibly might trigger a reporting requirement. And I don't really think it, would, it makes any difference. The address for the flowers, of course. Um, one could maybe claim there's a difference. I didn't really give it to you. I gave it to your office. 
You're walking on a thin line there. It's clearly was meant for the bereavement. So. Yes, sir. Oh, that's actually a very good question, sir. Um, travel gets reported on your statement of economic interest. We call it uh, the travel section. It's really your schedule F. And you heard me say over and over, and I'll say it for just the last time, I, I promise, your travel has the heightened reporting requirements. An easy way to think about this is because of the heightened reporting requirements. Unlike with gifts, when I say gifts, we really care about it's a lobbyist, a lobbyist principal, or a contractor. For travel, if anybody pays for official travel, well, not vacations, but official travel, that you know, it's legitimate for you to go on, and it's paid for by anybody other than state or local government or state agency or local agency, anybody, you will have to report that on your travel section, assuming it's more than $100. Anybody. A for-profit corporation, Boeing pays for you, you report that. A nonprofit, the Salvation Army pays, you go. Your local church collects money, so you go to the conference, you report that. Your next door neighbor is a nice guy and very wealthy, he pays for you to go, you report that. All official travel that is being paid for in an amount of over $100 is not being come from Virginia state or local government. That's being reported on your schedule. So it's just reported once a year. It is reported once a year, that's correct, sir. Yes, sir. The Statement of Economic Interest Forms for Newly Elected Board of Supervisors members. Everyone else, it's February 1st, but it says as a condition of them taking office of January 1st, but the new forms are not out. Do they wait for the new form to come out? And I don't know if they'll be, it says they'll be out 30 days prior, which could be January 1st. Do they use the forms that are there now and have those in prior to January 1st? Uh, the question, the uh, gentleman's question is uh, when he's uh, getting ready to take office, um, is this a situation where you're actually taking your oath of office and beginning positions in the month of January or in, in December? End of December, be taking the oath of office prior to starting January 1st. Uh, the, the clerk should be giving you and is supposed to give you the 2019 form. Uh, for those, the, the one time where you sort of get caught in a bind is you, you filed once for elections, but that's completely separate from Coya Council and your local clerks. That's just a requirement of filing for, to run for the election. Uh, then your first day in office is going to be in December, so you have to file December on or before. And then in January, uh, make a photocopy of everything, you're going to be handwriting it all again. January, you've got to do your annual filing. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's month to month, back to back, but that's the way it is. Uh, the only people who are exempt from sort of combining your first day in office and your annual is if you take office in the month of January. So the clerk should be giving you your 2019 form. And then they'll be giving you your 2020 after January 1. So if you're taking office January 1st or later, then you only file once. That's correct. For in or take office? Uh, we have we have been formally advised it's when you actually take your oath of office. That is when you begin. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. arguably, if you haven't taken the oath of office, arguably you're not really in that position. <laughs> but what is, but the term doesn't start until January 1st. <laughs> yeah. um, the term so, the term of all. Uh, uh, if the term of office begin, if the term of yeah, if you took your oath like on December thirtieth for the term beginning, yeah, then it's when your your term when your office actually begins. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. We have actually have had some situations where people took the oath of office and began actually working working on like December fourteenth. And all right, that's that's valid. But then you have to do a December filing. Yes, ma'am. So if your county is member of the Board of Okay. Super question. So, board has a table that is $6,000 and not registered. Okay. So, you should report that, even though it's our membership that's fine. Did your county pay? The county is a member of the chamber and bylaws. Okay, the county pays for the table. Okay. At that point, you're not really receiving anything from the chamber, you're receiving it from the county. So, do you have any further questions on that? As always, you know, go ahead and check those afterwards. We'll, get, we'll find two of the details. Where do you get the link for the train? Uh, it is available on the council's website. Um, I neglected to mention, but the very last page of my handout is our contact information, so you can reach me. Uh, you can reach Rebecca the other staff attorney. Uh, and that has information as well on our website. So. And if a member does not complete it, it should be a flexibility. Uh, for local elected officials, uh, there is no penalty for uh, taking the training. Specifically, it was, it was in the statute. Um, so there, there is no penalty. Um, we recommend that you do it because, at the very least, hopefully this presentation will at least learn you some 
potential landmines you might avoid by thinking about the old uh, about coming into my property directly. Okay. 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 Okay.
Uh, yes, sir, I'm sorry, perhaps I was not as clear. If you go to your county attorney, it, and it's an attorney-client communication, then that would be protected from disclosure. My point was that an opinion by the county attorney only gives you evidence to present in a prosecution for violation of the act. It does not preclude a prosecution which getting an opinion from the Commonwealth attorney or from the Coria Council Bench. So if, if there's a trade-off. It's, it's the written opinion or the verbal from the county attorney can be used as evidence that you were not acting willfully in violation of the act in a prosecution. But the ideal situation is to never get prosecuted at all. And so if you get that opinion from a commonwealth attorney, you can't be prosecuted. I think we're almost out of time. Maybe one last question. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, on page five, they say you have disqualified yourself from the transaction that's so about to be Which you might have a personal interest. Um, I would call some of the code if you think there's a potential personal interest that you can reveal your interests and say you are acting in the best interest of the community and your board uh, with the entity and the I think it's external employees um, that work there. Could you elaborate on that? So I apologize, sir, I'm not familiar with that code provision. Um, it's definitely not in, in COYA. There, there is no sort of good faith exception for participating in a personal transaction. We should have a personal interest, but we think it's okay. At the very least, that's not in the COYA Act, which is why we always say, if you think you may have an issue, please check with us first and we'll let you know whether you can proceed or not. Thank you, Stuart, very much for your time. Uh, thank you all. And Thank you.